Scripted television is not the same thing as real life. Yes, I hope you're all sitting down for that one, but hey, it needed to be said. Look, you didn't come here for obvious statements, but that one needs laid out up front when presenting a list of fictional characters who don't behave the way people do in the actual world. I'll save you all the time in the comments now, it's not real, yes, I know. But, 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 that doesn't mean characters shouldn't be required to follow a standard set of rules in whichever fictional universe they're in. If you tell me right off the bat that Don Draper has 12 penises, then yes, weird flex, but it's okay. By the same and admittedly way less weird token, don't tell me a character has an incredibly important job that's integral to both them and the plot, then keep presenting me with situations that would see them lose said job. That is dumb television and I will not stand for it. My name is Adam Cleary and these are eight TV characters who would have been fired in real life. Number eight, Deputy Chief Tom Matthews, Dexter. I mean, really, from week to week, any single employee of the Miami Metro Police Department could have been canned. There was not a more grossly incompetent collection of law enforcement officials outside of Reno. The only person who was ever firmly on Dexter's trail was Sergeant Dokes, and spoiler alert, he was dispatched in season two. That left an embarrassing number of seasons where no one questioned why the creepy forensics guy was always missing at crucial times in an investigation. Take Deputy Friggin' Chief Tom Matthews, a man who, despite it being his actual literal job, couldn't seem less interested in the entire police department. Nobody higher up than him thought maybe they should look into all the catastrophes happening on his watch? No? I'm not even going to get into the fact that a trained investigator is somehow unable to join the dots with Dexter, despite having known him for almost as long as his sister. Idiot. Reason for termination? Gross negligence. Number 7. Ted Baxter. Mary Tyler Moore. Was there ever a character on live action television as universally reviled as blowhard news anchor Ted Baxter? And before you all say me, no, I'm not on live action television yet, so ha. Ted Baxter was intended as a commentary on the superficial personalities that tend to get involved with broadcast news. But the whole idea of letting him be a viciously incompetent jackass without ever getting his comeuppance really undermined whatever satire the creators were hoping to get out of him. Though he certainly looked the part of a classic newsman and had the smooth baritone to match, Baxter was as inept as they come. So much so that he wasn't just an inspiration, but the inspiration behind Will Ferrell's anchorman, Ron Burgundy. And his glaring unprofessionalism was usually cited for why the TV station WJM was always in last place in the ratings. Despite it being his fault, somehow Ted Baxter wound up being the only one who wasn't fired by the show's end. Reason for termination, gross incompetence. Number 6, Michael and Jim, The Office. Unlike some of the other comedy shows featured on this list, The Office was supposed to feel like a realistic bit of television. Well, I mean, sort of, at the very least a air quotes realistic sitcom, but it massively dropped the ball on its HR duties. Michael and Jim are both excellent salesmen, which admittedly probably counts for a lot at Dunder Mifflin, but there's no way their numbers are high enough to overlook the staggering amount of harassment charges that would have been leveled against the two of them. Michael's transgressions are well documented by the mortified responses of his employees, though they're usually explained away by his close relationship with whoever his boss is at that moment. But you can't ignore the constant complaints of a dozen employees for more than seven years. In the real world, he'd be out of the door as soon as one employee threatened to sue on the grounds of sexual harassment. As for Jim, oh, as for Jim, well, he likes to prank his deskmate Dwight. A lot! Sometimes it's light-hearted things like putting his stapler in a gelatin mold, but often it's intensely personal pranks that would end in serious injury or emotional trauma. This constant string of literal bullying wouldn't be viewed very kindly by a HR department, even at its absolute silliest. Reason for termination, actual harassment. Number five, Dwight The Office. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hang on a second. Don't think this is some big jobs with pity party for a massive dork like Dwight, though. As within rights, he should have been out on his ass quick smart as well. I'll not get into the Dunder Mifflin politics, as we've already covered that. Instead, I'll just read you his rap sheet, and you can decide whether or not you'd have kept him around had you been in charge. Dismembering a rescue and all. Egging the business of a prospective client. Kidnapping a pizza boy. Having a fight on company property. 
having sex with a co-worker on company property, starting a fake fire leading to mass panic and an actual heart attack, quoting Hitler and Mussolini during a speech. Yeah, not great that, is it? See you, nerd. Reason for termination, all of the above. Number four, Fraser Crane. Frasier. Widely considered the most successful sitcom spin-off of all time, Frasier holds another important distinction too. Most seasons spent ignoring just how bad the lead character is at their job. Frasier Crane, you see, is not a good radio host. And yet we're supposed to believe that everyone in Seattle tunes in every goddamn day to listen to him bumble his way through an unimpressive broadcast. He misses basic cues and inflates commercial breaks to suit his personal whims. But hey, I mean, maybe listeners just put up with him on the off chance they'd get to listen to him having loud, screeching sex on the air with his station manager again, because that's a thing he did and wasn't fired for. Truly, there is not a call-in show so simultaneously clumsy and boring in real life that would last more than a few months on the air. Yet this slow-moving train wreck was apparently the main focus of KACL's lineup. Reason for termination, terrible ratings plus shagging. Number three, Ross Geller, Friends. If we're basing this list entirely on work attendance, then pretty much every person in Friends should have gotten the axe multiple times over. Joey gets a pass, admittedly, because he's basically an out-of-work actor, but that is it. I know, I know, we don't see every second of their lives because that's called a documentary, but still, the amount of time they spend at work, as opposed to in the coffee shop, is laughable. The worst of the bunch? Ross Geller. The most neurotic person in this friend group also happens to be the one who shirks his responsibilities the most often. Remember when he got caught having sex with Rachel at the museum he worked at by actual children? Yeah, no, neither do his bosses, apparently. Even when he he went absolutely postal on his manager for eating a sandwich, he only got a sabbatical. A sabbatical for something he should have been sectioned for. Then of course he moved on to a role as professor of paleontology at New York University, where he had his academic research frequently discredited, is given consistently poor evaluations from his students, and actually boned one of them. We are trying to swear less here at whatculture.com, but f Ross Geller, f him and the f***ing horse he f***ing rode in on. Reason for termination? All of them. All of the reasons. F*** off. Number two, Tim Taylor, Home Improvement. Tool Time was a show ostensibly designed by the Binford Power Tool Company to help market their products and teach viewers how to use them. Tim, the tool man Taylor, was supposed to help sell the products he was using. Just, um, just let those two concepts sit with you. Just, just for a little while, just sit next to you like some weirdo on a bus. How then, I calmly and rationally ask you, an intelligent person, was he allowed to remain employed as a spokesman when he was constantly on the verge of stapling his actual nutsack to some poor audience member's hand because he neglected to read the goddamn instruction booklet on the tool he was using? Tim, the tool man Taylor, contributed precisely nothing towards anyone ever actually improving their home. Fundamentally, his literal one and only responsibility on this earth. Actually, while I'm here, how did Al, his considerably more talented and admittedly less charismatic co-host, stand there stoically for all those years taking sly dig after weight gag after mum joke without once hitting Tim so hard he woke up shitting teeth? Reason for termination, incompetence, harassment, safety liability, I don't know, take your pick. Number one, the entire sketch show cast. Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip. Studio 60 is the oft-forgotten post-West Wing Aaron Sorkin show about sketch comedy writing. It was actually good with both a capital A and a capital G, but it had the grand misfortune of debuting at the same time as Tina Fey's 30 Rock. And the debate between the two is one that never ever seemed to end in Sorkin's favour. To say the actual show within the show was unfunny doesn't quite tell the whole story because often it felt like the sketches weren't even trying to be. It was just more of the same sermonising that any other Sorkin show has, except this time there was no justifiable outlet for it. And so he shoehorned it into a weekly live comedy show in place of actual jokes. A typical Studio 60 skit made even the clumsiest of Saturday Night Live sketches look like their finest iteration of Celebrity Jeopardy by comparison. In fact, one game show style sketch Studio 60 showed called Sign Schmeyers, and try saying that 10 times fast, was so overly wordy and preachy that, honest to God, half Halfway through it, you would have thought the writer of the sketch would have been fired on the spot. Except this writer was actually brought in to help write the ship of the fictional Studio 60 and return it to the glory that it apparently had at some point in time. It was... 
awful, to say the least. Not a single person on that cast would have survived their first season on Saturday Night Live. Reason for termination, ratings. Could they be any worse? 